So the ones that the ones that like this right here. There's a good. There's example. a good one. Yeah. I'm gonna film that. Do they have the stinging ones in this area? Um, I have seen. I mean, the ones I've seen around here that sting are the lion's mane jellyfish, which are about this big around and they're red, red or yellow. Okay. Um, so there are occasionally stinging jellyfish up here, but not very often. Mm -hmm. And and these guys. I mean, these little bitty ones I haven't seen so numerously before. They're called sea grapes, the little bitty ones. Okay. So you're a biologist, a marine yeah. biologist? Well, I do, I do coastal, coastal biology and, and marine biology, yeah. Oh, and for, for so, what? For the local... Uh, I, work, I work for a group called the Casco Bay Estuary Partnership. Okay, and that's down in Portland? Uh, it's in Portland, yeah. Um, so what I, my, my actual sp specialty as a scientist is, is wetland restoration. Oh. But I, because I work on behalf of a, a coastal bay, I spend a lot of time thinking about the in invertebrates and other organisms that of occur here as well. Do. And a lot of time thinking about, um, um, we spent f Friday, for example, going out looking for things that are now found on the coast of Maine that when I was a child were not here. Well, um, for instance? Um, well, there's species of crabs that are coming in. There's a shrimp that we found that has not been seen in, in the area before. There's a bunch of things uh, called tunicates. Um, and there's four or five species of tunicates that are not, yeah, it was really Why fun. Why are they coming back to you, Susan? Well, they're not so much coming back. Most of them are Asian species, and they've been traveling around on people's ships and things like that, and they've been moved around the whole globe. Oh, okay, so yeah. they were here at one time. No, probably ne probably oh, were not. They evolved in, in, they evolved in Asia, and they don't have any any competitors or predators here. Could that be a problem? It very much, it often is. And so the, that's the, the whole point is we're looking at them from the point of view trying to look at invasive species and finding out whether they're going to cause problems. Some of them clearly do. Um, and, and I don't know what's up here in Eastport. It would be great fun. Uh, there, there, actually, there's a, some other people who've done similar work up here, but I don't know what's up here. I haven't looked into it. So, I see. Yeah. So uh, you do uh, wetland restoration. Mm -hmm. How do you, what is that? Who do you work for when you do something like well, that? Well, we—I I mean, I work for this group, the Casco Bay Estuary Partnership. Yeah. We do it on our own behalf, but we typically need to raise money from a lot of different groups to do it. Um, so a lot of it is funded by NOAA in one form or another, or funded by EPA. Um, there's a variety of different ways we do it. Um, is it do we have a, a, a problem with wetlands? I mean, um, we, I mean, I assume that at some point we probably didn't take it seriously. Well, Maine's, Maine has about half of the original wetlands it had. Um, um, at the, you know, when Europeans first settled here. So in Maine it's not so bad, but a lot of the other, other parts of the country have lost a lot more. Um, what we're particularly interested in is salt marshes, coastal salt marshes, and looking at how we ma make sure there's enough salt marshes to act as things like nursing habitat for, nursery habitat for fish species and things like that. And shellfish. Birds, and shellfish, birds, migratory birds use them a lot. So um, in our region we're not particularly short on them, but most of them have been degraded by various, usually by roads being built across them, which stops the tide. Oh, sure. So we can go in and we open up, a, open up the road, put a large culvert under it, let the tide get back through, and restore not so much, it's been a wetland anyway, but we make it much more functional, much healthier. So how do you choose where you're going to restore? Who chooses that? Um, we have surveyed um, using a combination of on-the-ground methods and um, uh, using computer map analysis. Okay. Uh, we've identified about 130 sites around Casco Bay. Um, and we've gone through those and looked at every one using aerial photography and looking at LIDAR elevation data. And what we've tried to do is really figure out um, which of them are the ones where we think we'd get the most bang for our buck. Um, now, we haven't done detailed on the ground surveys of each, and so you don't know what it's going to cost. So you get out there and look at, you know, the engineering depends on the structure you're trying to fix. So we haven't done all that much work on the ground, but we have a good list of where are we going to search next. And then we have a long, day and a half long day of field collection for each site to evaluate it on site. Mm -hmm. So we've got a series of steps we go through. We do the map analysis, then we choose our top 20, we go out and visit those sites, do the detailed analysis, choose our top two or three, then we talk to the neighbors and find out if we're going to be able to do it legally, because, oh, yeah. you know, it's not our land. I got you. Um, so we have to make sure everybody's okay with it and start building coalitions and raising money. And so it's a, it's a, one of these projects is about a three-year project usually. Is it okay? Three wow, to four years. Years. Yeah. Not 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 all of them are as uh, no as intensive as the that. problem. The problem is organizing it. It's not the work will take you know a, a couple of weeks if you could just hire a consulting firm and put in a culvert and not worry about permits and not worry about permission and not worry about landowners and you could do it really quick but that's not the world we live in right. so most of the work is on the organization and the engineering and checking do you do out. you run into a lot of uh you know you know 
blockage from people that say we don't want this wetland or I mean is that not so much not so much for the coastal wetlands we would get that probably more if we moved inland um, people because are really that becomes a swampy issue yeah and people are concerned a little bit in the salt marshes about mosquitoes yeah um, and so we do occasionally get but but we don't see a lot of that in the part of the state we're in and uh, you know um, the other thing is it's not our land if somebody says no we just walk away I mean it, you know it's not, you know, no. <laughs> there, there's 130 of these sites. If we have one that somebody doesn't want us to do, we'll go do it somewhere else, you know. Yeah. Um, and often oh. we actually are improving things from a uh, nearby residents' point of view because we're increasing fish access to the site, which reduces the number of mosquitoes that are there. So, you know, uh, yeah. it's like you can talk about that with people and try to explain it, but if they don't believe you, they but don't believe you. But it's also open space, which can increase property value. People yeah. like open space. And they like and they, the, yeah. They like the, the um, natural environment. But there are weirdnesses to it. Uh, restoration, the first two or three years after you re restore water movement into an upper part of a marsh, you might kill all, th all the vegetation that's there because it won't stand the salt. And so it might look really ugly for a year or two. Oh, okay. And so you really have to have landowners who are on board and make sure that they understand what you're doing and understand what the risks are and are comfortable dealing with that. Yeah. So Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's neat work. It's a lot of fun. You're very fortunate to have a job like that. It is. It's I love a lot your of fun. work. Good for you. Yeah.